Welcome to the Start Something Show. Join world-renowned experts, change agents, and everyday folks who have done the amazing. All here to help you start something incredible. Now it's time to step out, live your perfect day, and create a legacy with your host, Tina Dietz. Oh my goodness, it is a frenzy up in here. My family and I, this, this is where it gets crazy. Uh, welcome to the Start Something Show, VIP Backstage Pass, by the way. This is Tina Dietz, but obviously I've got my mind in a 15 different directions. Do you find that as an entrepreneur, as someone who is wearing a lot of hats, that you suddenly find yourself starting one sentence but finishing another? Yep. You know what? Sometimes that happens. I'm going to be talking with Steve Olsher today. And man, this dude, I'm telling you, he uh, he calls himself America's reinvention expert. He's a really great guy. He's got a couple of New York Times bestsellers. I'm going to be participating with him this fall in an event he's hosting in San Diego called the New Media Summit. You can check that out at newmediasummit.net. And it's going to be a blowout event. We're only accepting 150 people. This is going to be a couple of days of training for those of you who want to really know how to leverage new media. What do we mean by new media? We mean podcasting, we mean YouTube, we mean blogging. The modalities that have really come up in just the last decade or so to help you promote your business. And most of these opportunities are free. This is free marketing if you know what you're doing. So that's a that's a very, very cool opportunity. And I'm going to have another offer here in just a moment when I thank our sponsors for the show. We are going to get right over to Steve. Oh, and by the way, one of the reasons that I am starting one sentence but finishing another, like what I just did, is because not only are we moving across the state, but we are dropping our stuff off and then going on a cross-country trip with the family because that's how we roll, right? Craziness. But that's all part of having a business oasis. It's all part of the game of having a created life rather than a life by default. If anyone had ever told me a couple of years ago that I would be the sole breadwinner for my family and have a scalable business as an audio publisher for podcasting and audiobooks, I never would have predicted that. But you know what? When you are confronted by things in life, that seem insurmountable at the time. If you bring curiosity and creativity to the process, man, amazing things really do happen if you stay the course and keep going. We're going to be talking about reinventing yourself and creativity and all kinds of topics, everything from is college worth it to the mistakes that entrepreneurs make in this interview with Steve Olsher. Enjoy right after a moment of appreciation from the folks who make this podcast possible with a really phenomenal offer for you. Do you know that the number one reason why most businesses fail has nothing to do with their location, product offerings, or lack of business acumen? Nope. The number one reason most businesses fail is because they don't have enough visibility. Visibility is the absolute lifeblood of your business, and when you're visible, you'll constantly generate leads, conversations, and cash. The easiest way to gain massive visibility is to appear on podcasts, blogs, and social media channels of today's leading influencers. We've talked about influence all the time on this show, and you know these platforms reach millions, and best of all, it costs you nothing to be featured on them. Most business owners, however, don't know who these influencers are, let alone how to contact them. Fortunately, my friend and Start Something show guest, Steve Olsher, has released the ultimate directory of powerful podcasters, big-time bloggers, and social media stars, which includes detailed contact information for 240 new media influencers. These are folks who can make you famous with the push of a button. It's free, and you can download your copy at thestartsomethingshow.com slash directory. That's thestartsomethingshow.com slash directory. Enjoy. Hello, Superstarters. This is Tina Dietz, and welcome back to the Backstage Pass. We are welcoming back Steve Olsher, New York Times bestselling author and the worldwide expert on reinvention. So Steve, thanks for joining us back here on the Backstage Pass today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. 
My pleasure. Now, I want to go ahead and dive right in because you and I agree on something. Well, we agree on many things, but we agree on something I really want to um, talk about. It's a controversial topic, and that is around the subject of education. I've heard you say, and I agree, that college might be the worst investment someone can make. Now, I was a school and college advisor and educator myself, and I still agree with you on this. So why do you think college can be a bad investment? Let's start there. Well, you know, and just for clarification's sake, just so, you know, just so I don't start getting a lot of hate mail. Um, <laughs> you guys can send that to me, not to Steve. All right. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> you know, I don't think it's a poor investment if you know what it is that you want to do. But the problem is that 85% of those who graduate with a four-year degree do not work within their field of study you know, within five years of graduation. Yep. So, you know, the, the truth is, and, and just to kind of clarify a little bit here, the investment side of the equation, I think, is really in terms of it's the worst investment that a parent can make, right? Because, you know, ultimately, the return on investment for most parents is really just a return of that child to the home, you know, which is not kind of the return, I think, that they were anticipating. So, you know, that's, that's not a very good ROI. You know, because reality is that we just kind of move kids from the sheltered environment of getting the bottle from their mama to the sheltered environment of getting the bottle from the bartender. You know, I mean, I think yeah. it's really just sort of a social social experiment that, you know, we've now proven, you know, pretty concretely that it just doesn't work, at least not until people are very clear on what it is that – they want to do. Now, if you know you want to be a doctor, let's say, then by all means, go and get that education. I mean, if you know you want to be an architect, go get that education. The problem is most people end up going to school trying to figure it out, and that's the wrong order. I mean, you got to know what it is before you go get the education. Yes. Exactly. That's the, like the big missing piece. So you have some methodology around kind of drilling down and figuring that out. Can you walk us through whether people have gone to school or not, or now they're looking at, you know, what's next for them? How can people start to drill down and narrow down what's what's going to be a good fit for them? Well, I mean, look, the what is your what equation, obviously, is, is where I would encourage people to start. And that, you know, as, as we've talked about or, you know, certainly as I hope you'll you'll share, you know, we do give the book away for free. So, I mean, you can grab what is your what to discover the one amazing thing you were born to do at what is your what dot com forward slash free. Now, that's a shameless plug, of course. But, you know, the truth of the matter is that it is the right place to start because, you know, that is for for all intents and purposes, you know, people just get that wrong. I mean, they just they go in kind of blindfold and they expect to be able to figure out the answers. And unfortunately, just far too often, the answers don't show up. So that, I mean, I, I have to say that if you're going to do something, and, and again, it doesn't have to be what is your what, I mean, it could be what cause your parachute or, you know, the Myers-Briggs or whatever those things are that you find to be effective or others may have found to be effective. I didn't find any of them to be effective. You left me with more questions than answers, but that's a whole different discussion. You know, but until you just know, then, I mean, hell, go out, you know, as a parent, I would just give my kid 5000 bucks and a kick in the ass, you know, and just tell him to go out in the world, you know, and figure stuff out because you got to go work. You got to go volunteer. You got to go be an apprentice. You got to go do things that get you out of that, you know, that very small circle that so many of us live our lives in. Very true. You know, I've often said myself that I would like to bring back the, the concept of apprenticeship at a younger age, especially for you know, when, when people are not just even young adults, but in high school, because there's so much conversation in at that age about, well, what are you going to do with your life? But they have no knowledge. So how could they make decisions? Right. So yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, exactly. you're asking someone who's never driven to, to get behind the wheel of a Ferrari. And it's just like, don't be surprised when the when the car crashes. 
Yeah, exactly. And then that results, you know, in years later, you know, talking about why we have midlife crises. It doesn't start when you're 30. It starts much uh, younger than that. Yeah. But before I get too far off topic there, I want to circle back around to the business side of things because the majority of our folks here, of course, are entrepreneurs generally in their first five years of business or so. And they may have an idea, you know, what they want to do. They were already maybe kind of eating their business. But uh, you are have a lot of expertise in the area of internet marketing, internet sales, because you basically were, I would call you kind of one of the founding fathers in that, you know, time area, you've seen all the changes, you've seen the trends, you've been working with it, what kind of things are you seeing online marketing methods, sales methods, that have stood the test of time? And Could you uh, give us an example? And then also, what are you seeing that's become outmoded or ineffective, but you're still seeing taught or pushed? Yeah. I mean, in terms of what really stands the test of time, it's – and this this will last for millennia, which is just being very clear on who you are and how you can serve. Right. And not just serve, but serve those who you're most compelled to serve, because, you know, the the truth is that if far too many people just kind of jump into where they see the opportunity and, you know, and I don't have any qualms about, you know, trying to pursue the opportunities as you see them. But. You know, really, I, I think you're much better served creating the opportunity, right? Because that strategy will always stand the test of time. If you create the opportunity as opposed to chasing it, because what ends up happening is for so many people, when they chase it, it's already too late. I mean, unless you're a real early adopter, or, I mean, a super early adopter, it's almost always going to be too late by the time you get into the game. And and I don't want to sound cynical, but, you know, I mean, that is the truth is it's like, you know, unless you're creating something, the fact is that it's already been done by the time it gets to you. And I know that may not necessarily make 100 percent sense, but. It's so true that, you know, by the time it hits the mainstream, that opportunity is already gone. You know, because or at least the the biggest chunk of the opportunity is already gone. And so what I encourage people to do is, you know, really just stay on top of the current trends and especially in the tech space. You know, if you're not subscribing to newsletters like TechCrunch or the Drudge Report or, you know, Reading Wired or those sort of publications, then you're going to get that news, that information when everyone else does, and it's too late. So, you know, like there are groups out there that that specialize solely in sort of future casting, and that's what they do. And, you know, that's the kind of group that if you're going to be an online entrepreneur, if you're going to create a business, you want to create a business where there's opportunity, not, you know, behind the industry, but in front of you and – you know, that's something that a lot of people are willing to do because it's a big risk. It's a big risk to try to pursue the unknown versus pursuing the known. And the safe bet is always to pursue the known. But the opportunity, the reward is significantly reduced. So especially in the tech areas, what you're saying now, what if somebody is building more of a service based, you know, small business uh, that's not necessarily going to be as sensitive to some of the um, future casting kinds of, of tech trends and, and things like that. But they also might be more vulnerable in terms of the messages that they receive about what they should or should not be doing to promote themselves, promote their small business, grow their business. Like, is there a distinction you'd make between those sectors? I think, look, the truth is that if you're if you're going to be in the, the small business sector, let's say, I mean, and reality is that we're all in the small business sector for the most part, unless we, you know, we build something like an Amazon, which you know how many of those <laughs> there are. So, I mean, we're all really in this small business sector. 
Sure. Um, and I mean, I think the same principles apply because, you know, really, if you're, let's use massage, right, as an example, right? And massage is something that's been around for millennia, and it'll be around for more millennia. It's not going anywhere, but it's become a commodity. Like, I live in Southern California, and you can get an hour massage pretty consistently for $29, you know, and I mean, that's just insane because when you look at the, the opportunity cost for that company to put one person on one person in that space for $29, I mean, it's a, it's a losing proposition. And the odds of somebody coming back to that place are not very good because you can go around the corner and find another $29 massage, right? So how do you avoid falling into that that circle of uh, of really just chasing that opportunity and, and competing in a market where it's just a zero-sum game. I mean, you cannot win. So what can you do? I mean, there are ways that you can still compete in that industry. And if massage, you know, for example, is your thing, then the question becomes how can you really, and we talked about this, uh, you know, earlier, Tina, but how can you really sort of niche that down in a way where you become a highly renowned or highly paid expert, depending on, you know, where you want to take this? Like, for instance, you could focus on, on baby massage, right? I mean, I know that's kind of going to the nth degree or go the opposite way and, you know, focus on geriatric massage, right? But, you know, the point being that if you try to be that all things to all people sort of, uh, you know, establishment, then you're, you're going to find yourself with extremely low margins that just frankly aren't sustainable. So it's a matter of, again, looking at what the future holds and where that opportunity lies. So if massage is your thing, where is the biggest opportunity for you. And, you know, like you could look at things like CrossFit, right? I mean, like CrossFit is all the rage. But, you know, there's a lot of injury. <laughs> the cult of CrossFit, right? yes. You know, there's a lot yes. of injury. There's a lot of, uh, of muscle soreness and that sort of thing, right? So, you know, if you specialize in serving CrossFit athletes, well, then that's really playing to what is current and what will continue to be, I think, hot, if you will, for the for the foreseeable future. So, again, it's just a matter of understanding where that opportunity truly is and making sure that that small business idea that you have, you know, doesn't run its course in short order because you're trying to compete in that very crowded circle. Exactly. Yeah. The solo entrepreneurs, especially in the massage industry, are far better off becoming specialists than they are trying to compete in, on price. God, please don't do that. And with something like a Massage Envy or or the like, uh, Hand and Stone Massage, any of the other franchises, uh, or even, you know, as I've recommended to several of my clinic owners, you know, looking into fran buying a franchise yourself and switching gears. So really, really good example. Now, you mentioned, you know, keeping on top of trends. Do you have any particular resources that you'd recommend to folks that they either subscribe to or take a look at or, or read to uh, if they want to kind of try to stay ahead of the curve on, on things? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of them. Uh, as I said, I mean, TechCrunch, you know, they have a daily newsletter that they send, send out called the Crunch Daily. It's always going to be um, – th those guys are great. I mean, they really have established a position there at the at, – really at the forefront of that, at that, you know, bleeding edge, if you will, of technology – of where technology meets business. So, you know, definitely TechCrunch. Yeah, and look, I mean, Wired is still a tried and true publication. And, you know, if you wanted to get a little more sort of, well, following our theme, or if you want to niche it down even further, there's a couple of venture capital type publications that that are pretty interesting. So, you know, because obviously venture capital is always going to be on the leading edge of, of what's next because most of them want to get in as early as possible. That's where the bigger rewards are. And so that that's another area that you could focus on. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, are there any upcoming trends that you're excited about? Well, you know, I think that the biggest trend is just doing everything for your client, you know, because people are finding that 
they don't want to buy a course. They don't want to, and not to say that everybody won't, and there still is an opportunity there, but, you know, when you take a course, far too many people take that course and never do anything with it, but they know they still need to do what they bought the course for. So if if you're selling a course, let's say, in, I mean, heck, we could go anywhere with this, in WordPress, right, you know, and how to create your own site using WordPress, you know, just instead of selling it for you know, $997, sell it for $1,997 and give them the course, but also do it for them, right? I mean, get it started. And anything that you can do to save people time, you know, is really where, you know, I think everything is headed as it's been headed. But even more so now, the financial equation, the, the, the opportunity to profit doing so is, is finally catching up with the interest in having people do it. In other words, you can now charge what you need to charge to do it for them, and people are willing to pay it. And they want to be taught at the same time because so many solo entrepreneurs out there, they want to be able to transition to a different service provider with knowledge or transition to a different uh, platform and not feel like they're totally in the dark. So that combination of education as well as providing the service is just really winning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, and, Very you know, cool. you, and you could look, you know, the whole software as a service industry, you know, is certainly something that you could look to for an example, because it's really all about that, as TechCrunch calls it, you know, that do it for me revolution uh, is, I mean, it, that is truly where one of the largest opportunities lies right now. All right, folks, you heard it here, and now it's up to you to go and find the information. So make sure that you go and download What Is Your What? It's Steve's New York Times bestselling book. I have said this many, many times on his other interview. It really is outstanding. So go and download that and start getting ahead of the curve with some of these resources. Now, Steve, for all our super starters out there who are go looking to get going and fulfill their goals and dreams, what are a couple of action steps that you would recommend, uh, in addition to the ones I just mentioned, that they take this next week to help them start something? You know, I, I think that most people try to do everything by themselves, and, and that's a huge mistake. If you're serious about making the jump, let's say you're in a nine to five and you want to make that jump to being your own boss, doing your own thing, or if you have an existing business and you really want to make sure that that business stays in business for the foreseeable future, uh, you know, you got to surround yourself with people who are where you want to be. I mean, I just came from a very small joint venture summit where the majority of the people in the room were running uh, eight-figure businesses. And so I don't aspire at this moment to run an eight-figure business again. I mean, I've done it, and Liquor.com you know, certainly uh, will be there. But as I said, I, I don't have uh, any active day-to-day -day with that. But, you know, the, the truth is that when you surround yourself with those people you know, it, it definitely helps to elevate your thinking. And I think the next most logical step is to actually hire someone to guide you and hold you accountable and put you in that environment with like-minded people who are all there for one reason, which is to help elevate one another's business. So, you know, I, I think that if I were doing anything in the next week, it would be to find someone to hire as a coach or a mentor or to go find a, a networking group where like-minded people gather. Excellent. Could not agree more. So finally, what's the legacy you want to leave? Well, I think that the the short answer is I really want people to to understand that they have the ability to choose what to do with this moment and in literally every moment that follows. And recognizing that they have that choice, I think, is the ultimate legacy that, you know, I could leave. But you know, more specifically, of course, it lies with my with my children uh, and creating responsible adults that impact, you know, our world in a meaningful way. 
Exactly. That's beautiful. Paying it forward to that next generation. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for your uh, resources and uh, your experience and your expertise and sharing that with our Start Something Superstarter tribe here today. I really appreciate your time. Absolutely. Thanks again for having me on. Anytime. And remember, folks, you can go back to uh, Steve's page on the show here and download the book, get the resources and, you know, dive deep, dive often here on the Backstage Pass.